This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Dave McDonald. And this week we are very happy to have a Pulitzer Prize winning composer, Jennifer Higdon. Jennifer, thanks so much for being on the show this week. Glad to be here, guys. Now, we are huge fans of yours. Um, you have had many collaborations over the years. You're a professor of music, uh, of a composition at the Curtis Institute. You've collaborated with the Cleveland Orchestra, 8th Blackbird, Tokyo String Quartet, Hilary Hahn. We love all these people. Um, do you make these relationships yourselves? You're- yeah, that's a, you know, a lot of them, when I think about it, are probably connected to Curtis. So probably from having taught some of the performers and then I meet other people I'm traveling to orchestras. So, but I think most of them are people that I've either worked with, either there was a festival that was commissioning or something. But now I think about it, Hilary Hahn, she's a former student. Uh, Jennifer Coe, I've worked with quite a bit. She's a former student. Mm-hmm. Um, Yuja Wang, she's a former student. So I think a lot of them have to do with just the relationships and the school that I teach at. Yeah, it certainly is a great school. I mean, we see a lot of great artists come out of Curtis, and we're happy you can teach composition to as many people as you do. <laughs> it's really fantastic. I used but, to teach a really great class there, 20th Century Music, actually, where I managed to get everybody in the school at some point because it was a required class, and that was a history theory class. And I spent the whole year lecturing these kids about uh, commissioning. So I, I kind of miss that, but it, it pays off in a certain way because I think I'm hoping the person who's taken it over, David Ludwig, who's also a composer, mm-hmm. does the same thing. So I'm always telling them they are responsible to commission works from composers. This is like the number one message of the class. Yeah, that's I'm so nice. happy to hear that. <laughs> Uh, it's it's something that's very cool to to get students involved with early on is working with composers. Um, and I'm I'm curious with all these different collaborations that you do, how closely through the process are you working with um, the the soloist? I'm thinking particularly of the the concertos. We're going to talk about a, a concerto later in the show, um, and one of our our past picks of the week, maybe even our first ever pick of the week. I'm not sure. It was pretty close. Was uh, on a wire. Um, so I'm curious how closely you work with these musicians when, when, when they commission you. Yeah. You know what? It's, uh, I work with them pretty closely in the beginning. I ask them a ton of questions about what they want in their piece. Um, as you guys know, being composers, you can design anything the, any way you want. And my pieces tend to change according to the performer that's involved. I will find out if there's something specific they want in a piece. One of the things 8th Blackbird said, the piece you mentioned on a wire, they said they wanted to be able to move around on the orchestra stage. This is a concerto for orchestra and those guys. And I thought, wow, it's going to be kind of crowded in the front of the stage anyway when you've got a piano, a percussion, and then you've got four other players. I was sitting there thinking, how the heck am I going to move them around? Because they're fantastic about acting when they play. And uh, ironically... Just thinking about that, because at first I said, oh, guys, we can't have you move around. There's not going to even be space. But then I thought, oh, I could have them zip line down from the back of the auditorium. That might be <laughs> kind of cool. <laughs> but I realized in thinking about that, why couldn't I have them all just move over to the piano and play inside the piano? I thought that seems like that would be manageable. If you've got a grand piano on the stage, surely everyone can fit around it. And so I decided, yeah, I could have them moving. But that's what kind of gave me the idea to actually start the piece with them all playing inside the piano and to make that sound valid, I have them go back. But usually with these pieces, I end up talking a lot to them in the beginning, and then I just go off and write, and I will send them individual movements as I finish them, or I wait, if it's a single movement work like On A Wire was, I'll wait till the, to the point where I've finished enough of it that I can send to them. And in the case of Ace Blackbird, I actually flew into Chicago before the premiere to to really work with them because I wasn't sure some of these effects were going to work. I, I can mimic some of them in my studio, but you know, I'm only one person. So I'm trying to figure out how do you run around the piano? If you have a mallet, can you pick up a guitar pick while other people right. are bowling and doing crazy things? So I try things out with various people. Um, and then I make adjustments and I'm often still making adjustments to things if I think it needs to be adjusted. So I get to know the players really well, though. I like get all their recordings. I attend rehearsals if I can. I just try to get a sense of their personalities. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of fun. Right. Do they? 
Do you think any of these people believe you're a bit micromanagerial like that? <laughs> uh, no, amazingly not. I'm really good okay. artists that didn't let you do your own they, thing. I mean, they could just be, be being nice. Yeah, that's true. But I think <laughs> know now they're like, well, I'm always telling them, go ahead and tell me if there's an issue. It was funny right. when I was writing the violin concerto for Hilary Hahn. I, I would send her a movement and she kept saying, you can make it harder. You can make it harder. And I kept thinking, good grief. My stuff is actually pretty hard. It's, it's, it looks simpler on the page, but when you have to execute it, it's a, a totally different thing. But Hillary kept pushing to make it harder. Oh, it, wow. and so it got to the point when I, when I wrote the first movement, which is the last thing I wrote, I was like trying to trip her up. I was trying yeah. to see how hard I could make it just as a challenge. It was kind of fun. <laughs> Yeah, the composers, I mean, uh, performers might be careful what they ask for sometimes. <laughs> That's true. The, the time for three guys were like, oh, yeah, no problem, write anything. And then uh, when I sent them their concerto, they said, wow, Jen, this is really hard. And I, <laughs> I said, dudes, it's a concerto. So, Jennifer, one of the questions we normally ask when the show starts is, tell us what's up. But that is such a complicated question for you because uh, you're the hardest working woman in, in com composer biz, it seems like. Um, looking at your website, you've got a lot of stuff going on. One thing I'm curious about is um, the opera that's going to be premiered in Santa Fe based on Cold Mountain. Have you done much work on it yet? or? Yeah, you know, I have uh, I started it last February, and I'm almost to the end of the first act. I've been actually writing throughout the summer, writing every single day, usually seven to nine hours a day. It's a, it's a lot. It's been wow, very wow. Awesome. But, you know, and I've discovered opera is so big, you have to dedicate that kind of time to it. There's, like, no getting around it at all. And so, but I'm having a good time doing it. This is my first time in opera, so what I'm having to do is actually research things like i'll get into a section i'm like i don't know how long to allow for somebody to be buried alive so, so <laughs> I, I calculate well how long does it take to actually bury someone alive <laughs> um, take the change is set really i'm constantly asking people and uh so the first act is within a couple of weeks of being done amazingly so it's scheduled to be premiered in 2015 but delivery dates for opera are much earlier a right. whole lot so, but it's kind of fascinating because I'm doing residencies this year with a couple of different orchestras. So I'm trying to figure out with the traveling, how do I manage composing? Because I kind of have to stay on track, um, how to manage that. And that's, that's kind of an interesting balancing act, how to, to figure out how to do your schedule while writing every day. It's, that's, that's so easy. Sorry, yeah. that, that reminds me of a question that I had for you, um, reading about all of all of the things that you do, uh, when do you sleep? Because <laughs> you're 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 writing so much music, and you you have these these residencies, and you teach at Curtis. Um, how do you how do you balance all all of those responsibilities? That sounds like to me that sounds like a lot of stuff to take care of. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. I should first say that my teaching at Curtis, everyone at Curtis is adjunct, so I only teach two hours a week. Okay. It and there's no one at the school full time. I think there's maybe the liberal arts person who has liberal arts there, I think is the one full time individual. But I only have two students now. Once I started all the traveling, I had to drop the classes because I couldn't yeah. be there. So, so that makes it a little bit easier. But I'm also famous for not being able to sleep. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's, it's kind of a problem. I wish I could sleep more because I need a break from my brain, which is really super active, a little too active. But I try to squeeze things in. I mean, right now I'm working seven days a week. It's not, there aren't any breaks. Yeah. And, uh, and that's probably not the smartest thing in reality. But, uh, <laughs> but sometimes, yeah, you know, it's when you agree to do residencies, you, people contact you a couple of years earlier and you think, oh, yeah, that sounds easy. I, I can go, you know, visit with this orchestra for a week. Then when you get into the year, suddenly you look at the calendar and you're like, oh, I've got quite a few of these and uh, right. manage that stuff is insane. Balance is probably not a word that's in my schedule, so I probably need to get better about that. <laughs> so, I, 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 I want to make it clear that we're all composers and uh, none of us feel sorry for you, not even one little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I do it myself. I agree to do these things and then I'm like, you know, and I'm lucky because 
actually get to do them. I think that's the the bigger thing. I had an interesting thing at the end of last season. The Cincinnati Symphony has been without a music director for the past like two years. They just recently named someone. But for the intervening two years, they decided to ask a composer, a conductor, and a performer to design their, their actual concert programs. So I agreed to do this. I think Philip Glass did it last year. So it's been kind of fascinating to watch orchestral programming, how they put that together. Um, I've learned a whole lot, but it's been a considerable amount of work. So I'll spend actually two different visits to Cincinnati, two weeks where they're doing pieces of mine. But I, I kind of marvel at the entire process of the orchestra world. How do they decide what kind of pieces they're going to put on a program? What do they weigh that with? What does the conductor want to do? What does the soloist want to do? So it's been kind of an education. And sometimes I take things that I just want to learn about how it, how something might work. But okay. you're right. I definitely overcommit myself. And maybe I probably need to fix that. <laughs> with, with all your traveling, I'm really curious. Like, so you you write seven to nine hours a day, but you travel to do all these different residencies. Are you are you able to, like, just with your 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 way of composing? Are you able to write on the road and and do that kind of thing? Yeah. Do you need your Do you need your own little shell and desk at home to really write, or or are you okay doing it on the go? You know, I actually have learned to do it on the go. I travel with a laptop and a, a, one of those chintzy roll-up keyboards, you know, you see on late night TV around yeah. Christmas. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Are we going to see you on an ad for one of those pretty soon or something? I could actually do that. I could speak <laughs> on it. I do write on the road unless it's a residency where I'm really busy and I realize that the only thing I'm going to do on the road is actually do parts or something like that because I do my own parts and such. So, but when I was flying down to Fort Worth the other day, I've been so engaged in the opera, I found that um, I was able to kind of write ideas on the plane all the way down. I don't have perfect pitch and I have to have a keyboard in hand, but my kind of the way I hear in my head has gotten more clear with practice and time. And so I can sit down and write things out. I, th I think I fill the legal pad with ideas for one of the scenes I'm about to do in the opera. So, it's squeezing things in, you know, you can do a lot of parts when you're on a plane or you're sitting in a, you're sitting in an airport. And, and this is often when I listen to your show, I have these things down. I'm like, I'll just listen to sound notion. <laughs> so are you a, are, do you, are you a paper and pencil composer when it comes to the actual notation or a straight into the computer person? Actually both. I, Cause I started out doing it paper and pencil and I still do an extraordinary amount of sketching. Um, I have like notebooks. Um, I always have notebooks with me of some sort, music notebooks and just plain notebooks where I can write things down with words. But I do actually do short scores in uh, the computer. Even for orchestra pieces, I do short scores. And then I orchestrate. So I'd say probably 85% of it's in the computer and 15 is handwritten. Mm, that's interesting. Um, do you think that it's had an effect on the way your music sounds? Because this is a, with some composers, this is a, a thing they want to debate. It, you know what? It's been interesting because as I, when I've judged competitions through the years, I have noticed that computers have taken over the process. You can actually see it in the music. Um, I think it probably has helped my sound because I'm an awful pianist, so I can't, I can't play all the lines that I write because sometimes I'll have like 12 different lines going at once. There's no way I can play that on the piano. I struggle with two lines. So um, the, the computer has helped me in that way, and I think it has made it easier for me to do bigger pieces a little quicker, especially when I think about the parts. Because when I was going through uh, Bowling Green, we actually used to do a manuscript class, you know, with ink and a pen, and, yeah. rulers, and the rulers had pennies taped to the bottom so you wouldn't smear the ink everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I am so appreciative of computers. I feel like my life is so much better because of them, because uh, <laughs> I think it ruined my back and my eyesight doing it by hand. I tell you, all those years, so much easier to revise now, too. It used mm -hmm. to be like, oh, oh, yeah, definitely. No, to take a measure out or add a measure, forget it. If you were doing it by hand, it just wasn't worth it. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, uh, Dave pointed out something earlier this morning that I think we all appreciate, speaking of scores, is you sell uh, study scores. Ah. I think that's a that's a big thing. <laughs> well, I mean, from a from a selfish point of view, if you want your music to become canonized at all, 
making your scores easy for people to get their hands on and look at and appreciate in that way, a looking at the music kind of way, you know, I think is a good thing. And it's just appreciated by people that want to see how that noise happened, you know, that kind of thing. You know what? Part of this came out of the fact that uh, when I was a student, I was so frustrated because I couldn't get scores. Yes. I, I, you know, people are like, oh, it's a rental only. And I never understood the logic of that. I thought, well, if you're having a hard time getting your music performed, shouldn't you try to get the scores out there somehow? Nice. I'm so glad I did it, though, because my music publishing business has, has grown and grown. And we get like five or six orders a day now for scores. And I'm, right. I'm shocked by the volume. But I'm also kind of appreciative of the fact that people are curious about things. Uh, same with the chamber music. I didn't know this, but the publishing houses, they rent a lot of their chamber music. I don't ever rent chamber music. I just sell it. But it means a lot of music gets out there and people will buy it. And then they hang on to it till it's a good time to play it. Sometimes it's not always optimal, but they may need to look at it to figure out if it fits their group. So it turned out to be a, an accidental thing. Actually, it was because no publisher would take me, so I thought, well, I'll just do it. <laughs> we we love the DIY quality. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. Um, I had a question that just slipped because well, my brother called and I had to ignore the phone call. Sorry. I, I, uh, I was going to ask you a question. This kind of relates to what we were talking about earlier, how you you have all these questions that you, you ask of the musicians that you're working with, and you you try to, to tailor the, the piece to the, the kinds of music that they like to play um, and the sorts of goals that they have for the piece. And maybe this is the source of um, the tremendous variety that I hear in your music. I, one thing that, that always strikes me when, when I listen to your music is that it, it's each piece is distinctive. Um, and it certainly sounds related to your other music. I mean, it sounds like your music. Yeah. But at the same time, um, the, the piece we're going to listen to today sounds completely different um, than On a Wire for example. Um, so can you, can you speak a little bit to that, the, the, the variety that you have in, in your oeuvre? Yes. <laughs> I like the way you say that. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's that a lot of times the commissioners will tell me they want something very specific. The piece that you're going to play today, Concerto 4-3, the Philadelphia Orchestra came to me, which sounds funny now that I say that, Philadelphia Orchestra came to me. <laughs> <laughs> They said, uh, we want something that has a bluegrass flavor to it that shows up time for three guys, but it's going to be on a program with Tchaikovsky. They actually said that. <laughs> I thought, God, can I do this? Um, what I found fascinating, though, is what time for three would play would be very different than what Hilary Hahn would play in a violin concerto. And Hilary's was the next piece I wrote after doing this bluegrass thing. So, and the, week, and the piece after that happened to be the, the piece for 8th Blackbird. 8th Blackbird does a lot of extended techniques, and they'll try anything on the instrument. So, of course, I had to use extended techniques in that, but extended techniques wouldn't work for Hillary at all. Right. Hillary was very explicit about no improvising. At that time, she wasn't doing any improvising. Whereas the time for three guys said they wanted to do uh, a lot of improvisation in the piece, but we ran into this situation where they thought they were going to have like probably six, seven weeks together to be able to improvise on this concerto if I would lay down kind of a, a base for them to work with. But what happened was Zach DePew, one of the violinists, got a job with the Indianapolis Symphony, and he became concertmaster, which meant suddenly he was going to have to stay in Indianapolis right up to the point where we were going to do the concerto. And it, it occurred to me that they wouldn't have enough time to put together a 25-minute concerto, the amount of improvisation. So I made the decision to write something that sounds like there's a lot of improvisation, but I actually wrote a lot of it out. And I tried to make sure it was had some characteristics of bluegrass, which was kind of an interesting thing for me because I grew up in East Tennessee. And so I was around bluegrass as a kid, but I didn't pay any attention to it because I was the typical. <laughs> That's not cool. Give me some rock. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I had to figure out how to give them little spots of controlled improvisation. Uh, but I had to write most of it out because I didn't want to take a chance of sitting down with the Philadelphia Orchestra. If we didn't have much rehearsal time, which it turns out we actually didn't have much rehearsal time, 
I knew those guys wouldn't be able to put together a 25 minute concerto improvising. I mean, that's kind of an unrealistic thing to expect. So I try to capture the personality of the players and it, it means a slightly different harmonic language. Sometimes it means that the lines have to be different. It means that even the rhythms sometimes have to be different. Um, I, sometimes I do things for like middle school. I actually sometimes will do a project for a middle school. It's like working for those guys. That's the hardest thing for me is doing something for yeah. middle because the limitations are extraordinary. I mean, it's like, don't go beyond an eighth note and every instrument can only do like a fifth, the interval of a fifth. Right. <laughs> so tricky. But and, I, and they have to look at their fingering charts for anything that's not in the B flat major scale. <laughs> I'll exploit that because when I wrote something for middle school band, I noticed the kids love to beat on things. They love to play percussion. So I actually created something where they could take their pencils and play on the music stands. And I remember thinking, God, the, the band director is going to kill me because there's going to be kids beating on things in the band room. So and it turned out all right. <laughs> that also requires them all to bring a pencil to rehearsal, which is something. <laughs> there you go. I was thinking about that, you know, having, uh, having stood in front of a wind ensemble myself because I've also conducted. I, and how many times I said, where's your pencil? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm curious. Um, <clears throat> I, you're, you're saying you're selling a lot of your scores. I'm curious. Um, this had to have happened. I can't imagine this not have, having happened. But um, On a Wire was written so specifically for 8th Blackbird. I was wondering if you know of performances where people have just gotten together an 8th Blackbird ensemble and done that because it was cool enough that they wanted to. You know, that hasn't happened yet, but we have sold so many scores, and I've actually had a couple of universities tell me that they were thinking about running a competition in their school where the different instruments could audition. They would do it with the orchestra, and they would put in as the soloists someone from the flutes, clarinets, the violin, cello, so they thought they might try it, but I, it'll happen at some point, I have no doubt. The biggest obstacle with On a Wire was the interior piano stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I did that. I was really opening myself up to people complaining and saying, what are you doing to my piano, you know? But I had a, I had a Steinway technician check out what I was doing because, and I, I have in the score, it says no pianos were harmed in the making of this concert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not sticking nuts and bolts and hunks of stuff down in there. Although I have to admit the piece I was in Fort Worth for yesterday actually does have screws in the in the piano. So I do have some pieces that do that as well. Yeah. Your secret is safe with us. Yes. We don't tell anybody. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, what else is going on? Like, uh, I mean, we can look at all the stuff you've got going on. But is there anything that means a lot to you that's uh, coming up on the horizon? I have a couple of years this year. Uh, things that were written before I started the opera that are finally going to hit the stage. Um the uh, New York Virtuoso Singers are premiering a, a little short choir piece on October 21st at Merkin Hall. It's part of an anniversary celebration, 25th anniversary. They, they asked 25 composers to, to write works for them. So that's going up at Merkin. Um, the Rowan Percussion Ensemble also commissions something for their director, Dean Witten. Uh, and so I've written something for a dozen percussionists called Light Clockwork that's going up on November 19th, right before um, Thanksgiving. And uh, I thought it would be kind of fun to do something that's a little bit like slow motion keystone cops. I've got all these percussion stations, these 12 percussionists move around to the different stations at various points, sometimes doubling up on some of the instruments and moving along. And then on uh, February 19th, uh, Nathan Gunn is premiering Dooryard Bloom, which is a um, it's a chamber arrangement that I made of my orchestra piece, Dooryard Bloom. Um, he's doing that at Carnegie Hall on the 19th. He's doing that with Pacifica String Quartet. Um, and then uh, the really big thing, I think, is probably In the Shadow of Sirius. It's a string quartet and soprano piece for Chris Brandis and the Cypress Quartet. It's going to be on April 19th in San Francisco. And it's on the poems of W.S. Merwin. Um, who I'm trying to think, I think I ran across the stuff uh, in a Joel Puckett CD, actually, or not a CD, a CD in a flute concerto or something. But W.S. is this amazing poet. He was, he was poet laureate of the U.S., so that's going to be in the spring. And I, it's something I have a middle, middle school choir piece going up for a school here in Philadelphia. So that, so that shouldn't be any less, even though it's not at Carnegie. Those, those kids will probably be working just as hard. Probably harder. <laughs> 
That's great. Um, just a, qu- a quick note. Um, my wife uh, did her doctorate with Elsa Verdere. Oh, yeah. The and I, trio, yeah. And I've heard Dash a bunch of times live. <laughs> Performed by them and by students, and it's a great piece. It's like one of my favorite Verdere tri- trio pieces, and that's what my wife said this morning too. So kudos on that one. You know, that kind of story how that piece got to be. It's, a, it's like a three or four minute piece. I think it's very short. I was judging a competition that Verdere trio had applied to get a grant, and all their pieces were like eighteen to twenty minutes. And I thought they need something fast and short, and they just asked for something. So I thought I'm going to write a piece that kind of goes flying along at high speed. I thought that might be kind of fun. It, so. it, I've seen it finish concerts many times and it works like it's, you know, the chamber music of chamber music version of short ride on a fast machine. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, so, uh, this week, speaking of concerts, having mixed types of music, <laughs> <laughs> But that wasn't very good, you're, was it? You're, you're really stretching here, Sam. <laughs> Speaking of music. Speaking of music and things yeah. that make noise. Yes. Frank J. O'Terry this week wrote an article in uh, for New Music Box. And the basic gist of it was how interesting it is when you go to concerts these days and you see um, a mix of like a Beethoven sonata and then, you know, uh, a Conlon Nancaro piece or whatever, you know, you're going to see lots of different things on a concert and um, you end up taking those as a whole just because that's the way they're presented. And, you know, sort of asks questions about what does this say about uh, listeners and how we want things to be organized and, and this. Uh, so it's an interesting article from that point of view. Um, Jennifer, do you find that your music is, do you ever find it strange some of the time, like you mentioned being on a Tchaikovsky concert with a piece, do you ever find like, like, what does my piece have to do with this? You know, how, how did they come up with this conglomeration? You know what? Actually, I think 99% of the concerts my music appears on, they're standard rep concerts. I think, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting how that's the case i mean i remember one year i was on with like i had 50 concerts that where i was on with beethoven it was either string quartets the most intimidating is to be on with beethoven nine that's the one you think <laughs> anybody would be intimidated i think <laughs> yeah but you know, it's kind of interesting i think audiences want a little more variety now I've, i talk a lot to audiences to find out what it is that they want and it seems like they're skewing more towards variety. Uh, I hear a lot of audience members tell me that they are kind of tired of hearing some of the standard rep. They'd like something new. So yeah. I think it's a good thing. So when you yeah. say you talk to audience members, do you, do you just like hanging out in the lobby after the intermission and walk up to somebody and say, hey, I want to <laughs> talk to you. What did you think? What do you <laughs> like? You know what? That's a it's a good question. I, it's that I do that. I go out into the to the auditorium, but we often do pre concert and post concert talks where mm. we allow the audience to ask questions or make comments. And I've also, when I've done more extensive residencies, I've also gone in and done talks at like Barnes and Noble bookstore, and people come in and talk. And sometimes I have don they'll have me speak to the donors, the board members of an orchestra, and people will kind of confide in me off to the side somewhere. They're like, you know. First of all, I like new music more than I realized that I would. That they say they tell me that, and then they're like, "I wish we would actually do more." So they're usually random conversations, and I'm always fascinated to find out what people are paying attention to in a concert hall, and why the programming gets done the way it does, and why does one program work and another one? If you look out in the house, maybe there are people asleep, which well, I think what so. I mean, you got to sell tickets, and I think a lot of program directors are a bit conservative in how they go about programming. I mean, e- even if Because the you Beethoven have a, will bring them in. The Be- listen, the Beethoven does bring them in. Especially, Jennifer, if it's on with Beethoven 9, it's definitely bring them in. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you know what I'm discovering? I think, I think there may be audiences are actually a little more adventurous than the programmers are. This is what I'm discovering. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I think the audiences are into it and the... And, and the people who are designing the programs are just not totally convinced that something new will sell. You know, they feel like they need to give you dessert to go with the broccoli or something like that. That's mm-hmm. but we've had a couple of incidences in the past couple of years where um, I had 
concerto orchestra was on a program with the Dvorak Nine. This happened with two different orchestras. And they put my concerto on the first half and the Dvorak Nine on the second half. And people left at intermission. So they, for the second performance of that wow. concert, they reversed the program. They actually put the Dvorak on first put the concerto orchestra on and it kept the audience. So that was the first time I started thinking, oh, wait a minute, people may be more interested in new music than these guys are realizing. Uh, there was an incident last year, uh, the Philadelphia orchestra where we did a post-concert talk after a performance I had with them. Several people in the audience uh, asked the artistic administrator programming more new music. They wanted more new music. They didn't on the program. It was actually two different individuals. They weren't people I knew. And uh, I was I was actually surprised. I shouldn't have had that reaction, but I actually was really surprised. That's really interesting. You know, it's it's an interesting thing. A lot of times, I feel like we're, we're always putting together these programs of new music and in concert series of new music. And in a lot of ways, it's almost kind of putting w what we do in in a separate category and in kind of its own little ghetto. And we never people, I think should think of music that's being created now in a, maybe not exactly the same way, but a similar way to the way they think about Beethoven or Dvorak. Um, I mean, we're, they, they're composers and we are composers um, and, and we're using more or less the same medium. Um, so I, it's really interesting that, that uh, Franco Terry is kind of questioning some of these combinations. But like you say, I think a lot of times um, they're, they can be very helpful. Yeah, you know, I call it the iPod shuffle phenomenon. I didn't yeah. come up with that, but it, it, people really want variety in their concert experiences now, and so they it seems to feed something with them. And I I I find it fascinating. I know I don't go to concerts of standard repertoire anymore. I just if there's something new on the program, I'll go, but I, I just don't even go to standard rep now. Yeah, don't worry, we 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 won't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Five of us, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen all the big war horses. Well, not all, but, you know, most of the war horses performed live and I've heard them ad nauseum on CD. I just can't imagine what would inspire me to go to a concert of all that music, all standard rep. But one piece, you know, that's my excuse to go and hear a Beethoven symphony again, which I don't mind, but I'm not going to go out of my way unless there's a Higdon or a, a Gulo or a Blyton or something like that on there. Now, would you go for the... Um, the quality of the ensemble? No. <laughs> and the really? Really? Because, because Chicago came here and they did uh, New World Symphony, and I was like, meh. You kinda, know? It was kind of meh. Meh. You know, they're okay, world so famous the, for a reason, but, you know. What if, if the Berlin Phil comes over to the U.S. right in your town, are you going to try to get a ticket? No, because they're sexist pigs. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> They well, that's that is true for a long, long, long time. <laughs> and you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think they got. I think they got a whole, maybe a handful of women. No, they do. Uh, like four, two. two? Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, listen. We're living in the age of progress. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Ba baby steps. Baby yeah. steps. <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, so anyway, as by the way, in case you didn't know, Jennifer, I'm the I'm the senior women's issues correspondent on Sound Notion. <laughs> I, I'm always looking to fill the gender gap, and, and you know that kind of stuff. Um, we're actually going to have sometime soon. I need to email her back. But Sarah Kirkland Snyder has agreed to be on the show, and she has strong feelings about that. So I'm going to make sure that she knows I'm not having her on just because she's a woman. <laughs> we, we can't deny that she is a woman. So I'm sure we'll talk about it at but least. You know what? Session. Well, what Molly Sheridan a long time ago said, you know, make sure you have women on the show. Make sure you have women on the show. This is great. And um, I think the word know, she I, used was lady composers. Lady, lady, <laughs> lady composers. <laughs> but we have Jennifer Higdon on this week. We're going to have Vicky Chow next week. And so I think we're, I think we're doing we're, pretty good. We're doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's feel, let's feel good about ourselves right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing good. <laughs> so, um, Frank O'Terry also mentions in this uh, uh, article about a project that he was involved in, sort of like a, uh, what is it, an exquisite corpse? Is that what it's called? 
um, but oh, yeah. executed via Twitter. Now, now, Jennifer, I think you intimated to me in your emails that you use technology for what you need to do, but you're not like a technology hound or anything. And you don't have a Twitter handle, I understand. I can't find any more hours in the day. <laughs> so, <laughs> and well, you should... I'm afraid I'll read this stuff. That's the problem. I'll get distracted. <laughs> So I try to be disciplined. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> I think we'd rather have you writing seven to nine hours a day instead. That's <laughs> yeah. that's good. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So anyway, you can actually there that this piece has been written, and you can actually listen, and we'll have a link. You can listen to it on the uh, the website that they've put together for this project. You can listen to a MIDI rendition of it, and you can actually look at and download the score. And uh, so he's kind of taking the idea of programming where you have a bunch of different sounding pieces that are even being sung in different languages and things like this and extending that idea, which I don't know if the, the connection really holds up, but it's interesting still to the idea of doing this Twitter project where it's not a bunch of different prog stuff on the same program. It's a bunch of different fragments crammed together to make a piece. And he says that it works as a piece. And I have to say, even with the, the soulless finale playback, <laughs> it it works, you know. I think it's a pretty interesting little piece, and it serves itself well by not being incredibly long. Um, so anyway, I would encourage people to listen to it and see what you think. And he's got an excerpt of uh, his music, I think it is, that he contributed to that. So 30 different composers uh, put this together, and the way I understand, they're going to keep doing it. So I'm interested to see what happens with that, and I would actually like to get involved. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we kind of buried the lead, I think, today, wouldn't you say? Um, probably the probably the biggest story in in new music this week uh, was the the unfortunate loss of William Duckworth, um, who who died on Tuesday night, I believe, um, and it was first, I think, reported to the the world at large by Kyle Gann, who has a a really lovely. O obituary for Maestro Duckworth on his blog, and we'll we'll have that link in the notes. And uh, since I read that, I've been thinking all week about how we could make some some nice tribute that would even be close to what uh, Kyle Gann wrote. Um, and I, I couldn't come up with anything. It, he is it's a just a really lovely uh, piece, and, and you should all go read it. Um, but uh, Duckworth, of course, was was one of the the really great composers uh in american music and often overlooked i think um but his his music was was very beautiful kind of um post minimalist kind of second or third wave of minimalism um and it, he was also uh in addition to being an amazing composer just a, a really brilliant writer and advocate of contemporary music and not just music that sounded like the music that he wrote all kinds of of music of the 20th century um so it's it's a tragic loss i don't know if you guys have anything you want to add i'm sorry to bring everybody down <laughs> but uh you no know, actually i think I, I have to say i owe something to william duckworth because i used his book 2020 in my 20th century music class the 20 new sounds of the 20th century this one and that that book yes perfect that book was so fantastic for the Curtis kids because it came with a CD. They got to sample all kinds of different music, and the music was so varied that it was, it was, it was great. So I, I've always thought it was a brilliant book, really, for kind of a, an overview. It's not, it's not that things are in depth, but it was just like the right amount for the Curtis kids. Yeah, and, and he writes so invitingly about music that can be very challenging. Um, yeah, like you said, it's, it's a fantastic book and, and I would encourage anybody to, to check it out. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on, on Duckworth? I don't want to No, I mean, I think he did, did it great. I, like I said before we came on the air or started recording, that, that the, the best quote from the Gann piece is, uh, I have frequently described Bill's music as Mozartian, by which I mean it has a clear right brain logic that is difficult to pinpoint but easy to hear. Um, if the culture ever changes so that elegant design is once again as highly valued as macho eclecticism, I think that he w it will be realized that Bill is truly a major composer. And I think that's pretty apt. Yeah. I listened to some Duckworth this morning, and, you know, there's no getting past that it, it doesn't disappoint you on sophistication, and it doesn't disappoint you in any way. You know, it's 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 elegant and beautiful, and 
you know, elegant and beautiful, especially for people who know me. Those are terms I would use to describe music I don't like a lot of times. <laughs> but, but this is elegant and beautiful in a way that even Sam likes it. And if if you're not familiar with Duckworth's music, one of the the pieces that keeps coming up in this conversation this week is the time curve preludes, a set of piano preludes that are that are really amazing pieces. Um, and for which he's most known, yeah, the, probably the piece for which he's most known. Um, and they were recorded, I guess, just last year by uh, Andrew Lee. And w- you can, if you're not familiar and you're listening to this very shortly after we post it, or if you're listening to it live, um, the Andrew Lee's recording on Irritable Hedgehog is free um, for for anybody who wants to get into his his music is being offered for free as a download uh, from Irritable Hedgehog through the end of the day today Sunday. Um, and if you're listening to this afterwards and you missed the window for the, the free download, you should buy it anyway because it's fantastic. Uh, not only is the is the composition amazing, but uh, the, the performance is really lovely. Um, so you should check that out again. We'll, we'll have a link to that as well. Um, so should, should we... Sam? Something, I, something I learned about Duckworth uh, reading Kyle Gann's piece is that his degrees were in music education. Uh, and, yes. and Gann points out that the reason why he didn't he started as music ed and never changed officially is that during the Vietnam era, changing majors was seen as a way to try and skip out of getting drafted. So he was kind of locked into music ed. Um, and in that vein, there's an article this week in the New York Times. Um, now, this is stuff that's been talked about ad nauseum, but there's a, a new study linking um, basically early music lessons with certain kinds of intelligence. Um, and the big thing that this one has discovered, this is a uh, by Perry Class, MD, um, in the New York Times level link. Uh, the, the big thing that it points out that hasn't been discovered in any other study, or at least not to the degree that it is here, is that um, there's benefits cognitively even if the music lessons were early on and then you stopped and never kept it up. Didn't keep playing an instrument and didn't keep actively engaged with music. But laying that nugget in you when you're a kid has cognitive results later in life that are beneficial. Um, pretty interesting and stuff. How early on? Uh, I mean, I mean does this have anything to do with like people who are in music programs at schools generally do better at school? No, I think like, they're talking about earlier than that. I think yeah. they're talking about really young kids, like three, four, five. Yeah. Right, but um, is this like, I'm not saying it's... A, chicken or the egg scenario but i mean maybe this is a reason why you might see kids in music programs at schools because they have this early early on i don't know i don't know that it addresses that um just thought well anyway i had had no early music as a kid growing up it was rock and roll in our household that's it (laughs) (laughs) my my household was no music at all it was it was npr it was npr all the time on the radio you had the NPR themes. Though. I had. That's true. <laughs> I think Nate is probably the only one that had a rich music existence as, as a young child. Yeah, my my dad's a guitarist and singer, and this is a, and my older brother played guitar growing up and everything too. So I mean, I was always around it and sang in the house and things. And well, um, I, I can't can't prove anything by this, but anecdotally, I would say that for me, getting into music, and the reason I got into music is because I failed seventh grade the first time through because my parents got divorced and I didn't feel like going to school, and that ended up changing my life in huge ways because I took beginning band my second time through seventh grade, and nice. uh, and I I can't talk enough about how you know obviously that's affected me a lot, but I really think it's you know, made me smarter. And, 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 and also it has benefits that I think this article doesn't address, but when you're like, uh, you know, a fat nerdy kid, you don't get a lot of acceptance generally in high school or middle school. But if you're in band and you can play the hell out of your instrument, it doesn't matter what you look like. You immediately rise to the top. So it's a kid gets a chance to see, Hey, work hard and get succeed, success and recognition for it, you know, which, you know, is an adult kind of thing to think, but, doesn't play out that way necessarily for kids right. very often. It's a great place for kids to, to collect together, too. I remember hanging out with all my band buddies, you know. It's, we were our own little group, and it was, uh, 
I think school, junior high and high school are hard enough to go through. So it's good to have something like music to, to get you through that experience. Yep, and and that proves that we're smarter than all those jocks that made fun of us. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, playing music, making you smarter, um, in addition to some free beer, might be the reason why people would want to volunteer to play uh, with Amanda Palmer on her current tour. Uh, the Twitter sphere has been all a Twitter, you might say. I see what with, you did there. Yeah, has been all a Twitter with this uh, Amanda Palmer, who, if you don't know, raised uh, like over a million bucks. She's, I think, and, she's the biggest, uh, the, the the biggest Kickstarter project for music that yeah. that has ever been. So I think it was one point one point two. I think one point two yeah, million to to sort of uh, you know fund and promote a tour. But she put out a request asking for string players and brass and I don't know what all saxophones. Yeah, to come and play during the tour for free, and they will get um, free food, free beer, merchandise, and hugs. And hugs. Now, <laughs> I don't have as strong of feelings as some other people about this, so Dave, why don't you tell I us? I think it's completely ridiculous. If she, if she expects her concert to be good, she should pay these people, right? Nobody, nobody that's worth having at your show is going to do it for free. Yeah, and certainly not in the in the in the quantity that she would want, um, and and I think it's it it shows a, a serious disrespect toward the musicians, even if they are good, even if you're getting the New York Philharmonic to come and play your show for free, it shows a serious amount of disrespect for the, the hard work that that those musicians have put in, not only to learning their instruments but to to being a part of that particular performance. Um, to not pay them, and uh, it it really does make me angry to read. I this. feel the same way. I don't think she's going to have any problem getting musicians, though. So. Well, she's not going to have any problem getting crappy high school kids that. <laughs> well, you think it's just think they be, can. I mean, there could be. Jennifer has something to say, Patrick. Hush. That's what I'm wondering what it must sound like. I was thinking, what you have different people at each show. What would that sound like? How would you even make that happen? Well, that's what I'm thinking. It's going to be a bunch of middle schoolers who think it's awesome to take my Bundy down there. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there is a particular market of people that might that might go for this kind of thing, and it's now, probably people like me that uh, that are doing the the crossover um, between like, I mean, there is a huge culture like a of self hater now, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> well. I don't hate me. But. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, the article does point out, and I think this is a salient point about this, that it just illustrates a disconnect between the sort of you know rough and tumble rock and roll you know uh, world where it's where all, Nate lives. It's it's equally about you know getting paid as it is about being a rocker and having fun and partying and the world of you know if you can play a string or band instrument pretty well. You probably didn't grow up in that kind of environment. You grew up in a let's watch the baton and all be disciplined and play together, you know. Right. And, but I, and I think there are I, more people. I think there are more and more people that are doing both, li living in both those worlds, and that to me, like, might be the the main bunch of people that would go for this kind of thing. Like, to me, like, if I were to show up and like take my viola up on stage and play with them, like read read some charts down that I looked at the day before or something, that be that could be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to do that and play a whole show and not get a cut of the door, as as they were doing the show, then that would seem a little strange to me. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's what they're talking about. I think they might be talking about not like giving you a set stipend or something. I'm sure they'll give you drinks and then maybe. Maybe the twenty bucks that would be your cut out of twelve people from what they took from tickets of people coming in. Yeah, and that's well, and that's not unusual to me uh, from that kind of format within that culture. Sure, I wasn't but, really as upset. Go ahead, Nate. I'm sorry. But making this call out to people who are used to like getting their fifty thousand dollars to do this kind of thing for two hundred shows that year, then that's that's probably. <laughs> Yeah, not the kind of people that they're looking for. Well, I wasn't nearly as upset as Dave was about it, because to me, it's like saying, are there enough Amanda Palmer fans out there who also play stringer band instruments 
who will show up. It's not like they're trying to solicit people who wouldn't do it without pay anyway. I mean, I understand Dave's upset on principle, but to me, it's more than anything just a solicitation of her fans. Hey, do you also play saxophone or whatever? Yeah. You know, because no self-respecting musician who doesn't know her and like her, or very few, are going to actually show up. So, Right. Anyway, we, we want to keep our eye on this and, and maybe hopefully catch some YouTube footage of one of these ensembles and see what kind of <laughs> see what kind of production value she comes up with. Right. So, Sam, you know what musicians are getting paid? The musicians oh. of the Milwaukee <laughs> Symphony. Or, or as Alice Cooper uh, informed us in uh, Wayne's World, Millie Walkay. <laughs> <laughs> You know the scene I'm talking about. <laughs> nice. Anyway, take it away, Dave. Well, the Milwaukee Symphony, and I think this says a lot about the state of orchestras in the United States, felt fit to release a press release this week saying uh, that um, they 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 broke even <laughs> this year, that they that sure. they did not lose money on this season, and that they paid off their their outstanding debt. So, uh, congratulations to the Milwaukee Symphony. Um, in- There's an interesting side to that that I have been trying to figure out having looked at that press release because I know the person who left, actually, Mary Ellen Gleason, who was the president, she was there for two years, and I think she is one of the reasons they managed to pull this off, but she wasn't expecting to leave the organization, and I'm wondering what happened because I saw her at the league conference in June – and everything was fine. So I something is going on there that we don't know about because it seemed out of character for her to suddenly resign. I know she was making plans for projects down the road with living composers. She was talking about commissioning stuff and I'm I'm kind of curious. I think it's good that they raised as much money as they did, but I suspect part of that was her function there and now that this has happened I think we were all kind of wondering, all right, one of the trumpet players is stepping into that position. Hmm. What's going on there that we we don't know about? Right. So, kind of a curious thing. It does seem a little strange. Yeah, I thought that was funny that she. I mean, I didn't know the insider information at all, but I thought it was strange that they credit her with being the person who probably got the balance budget balanced, and she's leaving. And so that by itself, without any other information, seems a little weird. Um, it should be noted that they don't go into how they came up with the balanced budget, you know, and the funds, other than to say that they basically got some good new donors. So um, we all know that symphonies aren't going to make it just on selling tickets, but, you know, we've discussed a lot that the model needs to change some, you know, because, you know, figuring out a way to engage with culture that will actually generate some money for what they do rather than just through donations. So it, it doesn't say, but it sounds like basically one of the things that happened is they got some good donors, and we appreciate those. And they will be listed in the article. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering what the, those uh, Milwaukee Symphony musicians will be wearing when they start the season. I, I gotta Probably. guess. I gotta guess. We don't know yeah. the Baltimore Symphony. I, I, I bet they're gonna wear concert black. I bet they're going to wear tuxedos and, and, and black things. Think so. You know who probably will not wear concert black? Well, Who's sometime that? in the future. <laughs> the Baltimore Symphony joins with the Parsons School for Fashion to make over concert attire. This is a, a story. I haven't. It's very short. And I haven't gotten to look at it, really, but because Dave added it in process during the show this morning. Because <laughs> I forgot uh, about it. <laughs> right. But... Considering considering the very strong opinions some people on the show have had, um, Tim Rosenberg, um, <laughs> about concert attire, this is an interesting story to me because some people don't care, and then some people have very strong opinions about what should be worn on stage. So the question is, Jennifer, what do you think about concert attire? You know, I think it's time to make changes, and uh, yes. I think it's it's time to get more up to date to be quite honest. I'm it's interesting. I travel to enough orchestras and I, I've worked with enough of the orchestras that are currently in their negotiations for the contracts that it's been kind of an interesting overview because I work with the Atlanta Symphony a lot, Philadelphia Orchestra, Indianapolis, even Fort Worth is in the middle of their negotiations right now, but I suspect things are going on much better. And I know Marin Alsop very well and Baltimore Symphony. 
I, I'm totally, when I heard about this, I thought it made sense to me that it was Marin Allsop that was, she's probably the one who came up with this because this is the way Marin thinks. She thinks about how to reach out to the community. But I think it's kind of overdue time because one of the things that's been fairly spooky, I think, to watch for the past five years is audiences, the numbers have been dropping off everywhere. Mm -hmm. the, only, the only two places I've noticed that it hasn't really been happening, and there probably are other places that I just am not aware of, but... L.A. Phil, it's not been dropping off, and National yeah. Symphony. And I realize that the connection to these two orchestras is that going to the orchestra is a very social event. It's, it's seeing who's there and being seen, whereas in other instances, in some communities, you're just going to the orchestra to go to the orchestra. Um, mm -hmm. But because the audiences have been consistently dropping in numbers through the years, I think they're going to have to start trying a lot more stuff because it, it's pretty scary when you're in the audience and you look out in the house. If you're in a house that's only half full, you realize that something has to change and fast. So it's all, I think it's all connected with everything that's going on with the lockouts and the uh, renegotiations and kind of the difficulty. People are worrying about funding with orchestras. Uh, so I applaud Baltimore Symphony for taking this step. I'm wildly curious to see what they come up with. The question is, once they do it, will they stick with it? Yeah. Will they get more than one outfit, or how is it going <laughs> to actually play out? So yeah. So the, I, I think there there are like groups of of uh, people from from Parsons that are working on a few different uh, sets of designs. I'm um, really, really curious to see what happens. Yeah, uh, I, like I also like prototypes. one one thing that I really like about it is that they are engaging with other uh, creative professionals um, in in other fields. That to me is really interesting. Not not just that they're that they're updating or maybe not updating is, is I don't know, but they're they're changing something about the way they look, and the way they look is very 19th century. Um, and so I'm really curious to see what they come up with, but I'm, I'm really happy to see that they're working with, with some creative professionals as well. Can't you see marketing your orchestra work come this week yeah. and see what the orchestra looks like? And one week, maybe you sent them out dressed traditionally, but they're actually wearing those little bee things on their head that John Belushi used to wear on Saturday Night Live. You know, the little yeah. balls on the, the wires that were bouncing around. <laughs> kind of thing. So. I mean, it would be cool if you had different outfits and little things, something something unusual that you kind of wore for each concert. Who knows? People might show up just to see what they were wearing. And dig, dig this. Merchandising. <laughs> right? Merchandising. Right? No, no, no. Imagine this. Imagine, like, you go to, so you go to the NFL stadium. On your way out, there's a place where you can buy your Philadelphia Eagles jerseys and... What what if there what if you could you could buy like a replica crazy design <laughs> high fashion a, yeah, couture yeah. thing from the Baltimore Symphony and like that that would be your way of of representing your fandom of the Baltimore Symphony. Yeah, but the, jer the the sports jerseys have the number and the name on the back. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to give a name for every. Can we do violins and then trombones and then maybe percussion or something like? That? <laughs> yeah, I'm calling number twenty three. <laughs> <laughs> players could have a jersey, you know, like a, a recognition. Yeah. The interesting thing to me is that they're actually analyzing body motions in their consideration of how to design the attire, and I can tell you, I can't imagine any instrument that is easier to play in a tuxedo. <laughs> than a t-shirt you know what i mean <laughs> um yeah it's it's in, i mean in, a, in an age where we one of the things we don't want to do is alienate audience members i can't imagine that having them not in tuxedos would would i mean it, it seems like that could only help you know yeah, who's who's that pushing away right yeah. and real quick we've already addressed gender bias and i have a bone to pick about concert attire for years now women can wear as long as it's black and or white um, they can wear anything they want, and men are expected to always wear the monkey suit. That's not fair. <laughs> yeah. That's the first thing. You yeah. know what? I hear women complaining that they wish they only had one choice, the monkey suit. So I've heard the other the other <laughs> argument. Yeah. <laughs> Einstein thing. You know, Don't think about what you're wearing. Yeah. Men have really had it tough in this world. <laughs> yeah. We don't get a break. Yeah. We don't get yeah. a break at all. I know. Uh, CK Rocker in in chat on my merchandising point s suggests giant foam fingers at the orchestra. So. <laughs> they have number one. At, uh, number one. Like spring for music. 
Spring for Music is like the one thing that really, like, people just go nuts over in the audience. Yeah. And the yeah. proms, too. Well, the proms, I'd say. Sure, why not? And, you know, it just occurred to me when you were mentioning the guys wearing monkey suits. I bet if you told the public that the orchestra was going to go in drag for a concert, I bet you'd sell every ticket within 10 minutes. <laughs> You get a certain kind of audience too, man. That would be awesome. <laughs> that would be awesome. So, Sam, I think I think maybe that's a great place to leave it on her news. Are, are we ready to move on to the pig? pig the wee, wee, wee. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. So our our pick of the week, of course, is by uh, our guest Jennifer Higdon. Um, it's a recording of the piece, and we mentioned this a few times earlier. It's called Concerto Four Three. Is that how you say it, Jennifer? It is actually, and you're a good segue for that. This I think this is scheduled to be on the Spring for Music. Oh, brilliant! Uh, yeah, exactly in the spring, appropriately. So yeah, Concerto right. Four Three. Uh, people have been analyzing it and trying to figure out if the four dash three is some secret code. But it's not. It's because it's for time for three. So I thought, let's just throw off the musicologist a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So I, I this was, is, uh, Go ahead, Sam. I was going to get a study score and look for four against three polyrhythms. So you're losing that money now by, by <laughs> reading the mystery. <laughs> but I have to tell you something funny. When I, when I went to write the last movement of this, I thought, gee, I haven't used four and three in this. So maybe I should have places where I alternate between four, four, and three, four. So I finally relented when I got to the end. I'm like, all right, I'll do some, I'll do something that has four and three in it, but, but it's only at the end. So. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well, um, so this is a, this is a concerto, uh, for three soloists. And we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but, uh, it's for two violins and bass, um, and we're going to play, uh, listen to a little bit of the first movement. So Jennifer, do you want to maybe set this up a little bit and tell us what we're brought to here? Yeah, this is uh, the bluegrass classical hybrid. And these guys do some really weird improvisation effects. And when I went to write for them, we, we met one day with, uh, we had one of the, someone had an Apple laptop and we used GarageBand to record these unusual effects that they, they do. They've got all these weird names for them. They're little scratches and funky things that sound a little bit like an electric guitar, I think. So mm -hmm. we recorded that and I took the CD home. We burned the CD and then I made separate sound files and I tried to come up with a notation system that fits some of these sounds. So that first movement focuses on some of these really wild sort of sounds that you don't normally hear coming from a violin. So it's two violin and bass uh, for the solo group. And it's, it was fun just trying to think about how can you rock and roll on the front of a concert stage where an orchestra is playing. Well, we'll, we'll find out right now. This is a, an excerpt from the first movement of Jennifer Higdon's Concerto 4-3. And that is not the end of the movement. That's just something else awesome is about to happen right after that. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Like that. That last bit. Just like that. Now that I can't drop it in again from outside because we need to have that little thing. <laughs> uh, well, we, we run it locally, so it'll sound pretty good. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I was going to say that the, when I listen to that, the thing, one of the things that I think is is really cool, those percussive sounds, keep me in in mind of of a, like a jug band of of kind of improvised instruments. I really I really like that feel. Um, uh, of it just feels so fun and relaxed. 
um, in, 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 and like you said, it feels very improvised in, in a lot of ways, um, even though it's, it's very carefully written. So that's a, that's a really cool thing. It's, it's hard to do. And, you know, some of that, those sounds are actually just some bluegrass moves, the, the chuck sound. That yeah. actually, they play yeah. with the bow at the frog there. It's, a, it's not anything original. It's just that we don't normally use that in classical music. So I stole like crazy. <laughs> That's great. Nate's you know, a big I, bluegrass musician. Yeah, the chop is the best. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> it's, I think it really is successful, and it really works as a, a bluegrass hybrid to me. And I, I've been working on a project lately where I'm trying to make you know concert music sound like it's invoking not necessarily bluegrass, but like mountain music or old time music, you know. And that's not, yeah, it's not easy to do without sounding like you're sort of making fun of yourself, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true because, you know, my opera is Cold Mountain. It's an Appalachian story, and I'm trying to figure out now how to balance that sound with uh, the needs of opera singers. So, oh, wow. Yeah, it's an well, interesting challenge. And what you discover when you start trying to do that is like, well, I'm going to analyze some of this mountain music and bluegrass, and you're like, man, that is like a whole lot of pentatonic and one and five. And like, there's, from that point, there's just not a lot of stuff there. So how you're going to make it sound that way becomes a more complicated issue to me because just using the notes doesn't work. Yeah, you know what? With bluegrass, the trick is rhythm, actually. I discovered because a lot of the people I know who play bluegrass don't read music. It's such an oral tradition that's handed down. If you go, they have these mountain festivals where you go and you, they call them old timers days up in the Smoky Mountains where you'll see lots of groups standing out in fields and people just walk around from group to group playing and they all had they all know the standards it's like a form of jazz where one knows the standards but except it's appalachian mountain music which actually grew out of scottish folk songs it's an interesting connection but i've discovered by looking at the stuff and just listening to it that it's rhythm is one of the keys i think oh yeah um so uh, you mentioned earlier that you grew up in tennessee where in tennessee did you grow up i grew up in a place called seymour which is outside knoxville I know exactly where that is. Oh, really? <laughs> I, grew up in, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, yeah. and I've, I've hiked about 1,600 miles in the Smoky Mountains. Oh, my gosh. Well, we probably passed on a trail there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been out there quite a bit, and I did my undergrad at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Yeah. So I didn't know that you grew up in Tennessee, but I saw on your bio that you were born in Brooklyn, <laughs> and I'm like, she does not sound like she's from Brooklyn. And I, I was thinking she sounds Southern a little bit to me. Yeah. You know, people's Southern accents get ameliorated a little bit by being in school. Um, y you're talking to the professor voice kind of takes over. And well, what, why didn't yours do that? <laughs> well, when, when I'm home in Chattanooga, people tell me I sound like, oh, you sound like you're from Michigan now, you know. So yeah. that's true, you know, I because half of my childhood was spent in Atlanta and the other half was spent in Tennessee. But I went to school in Ohio and then I but I've been in Philadelphia 26 years now. Um, but I can slip back real fast to the southern if I need to. <laughs> and people ask me, they're like, you don't sound like you're from Brooklyn. I always say, oh, it's southern Brooklyn. Uh. <laughs> and, and you'll discover and jennifer i'm sure you can still do this now people can speak like uh what is it uh swamp people that's you know this reality they'll you, they'll put subtitles on there <laughs> it's like, yeah. i don't need no stinking subtitles i understand what that i had to talk to that guy <laughs> to get my transmission fixed when I was like, you know <laughs> Although I have had to, my partner is originally from the South, and I, when I go back to Tennessee, I sometimes have to ask her, "What did they say?" I don't. Somebody, I went somewhere <laughs> to the local Kroger's, and I was trying to find something in the grocery store, and I said, "Can you tell me where, like, the I need to find artichokes?" And she kept saying, "I ate, I ate," and I'm like, "What is I ate?" She was uh, trying to say, uh, I ate, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Southern Dakota ring, you know. So, right. <laughs> well, I went to June and Buffalo in 2000, and uh, people told me that that the, like they legitimately had a hard time understanding me at that point. So, I think I've I think I've ameliorated the accent some at least. <laughs> I think you sound good. I, you know, I have to admit I hadn't picked up on your Southern accent, but I think it's for me. It has to be extreme before I can actually pick up on it. So. <laughs> Usually people pick up on the pitch of Sam's voice. <laughs> Everyone asks me if I'm a singer. You'd be a beautiful countertenor, and they don't know that I can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should maybe ramp it up. 
I think that's it. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Sure, guys. Like anytime, it's fun talking to you. And I, I have to thank you for really for giving me lots of entertainment through all the times I've sat on airplanes. I know there are a lot of people on flights who think I'm nuts because I listen and I, y'all say something funny and I just start laughing and they're, they're like wondering what I'm laughing at. <laughs> well, you, you're probably the only person in, in the world that gets our jokes. So we appreciate that. Um, and, and next time you got something big coming up, we would love to talk to you more about this opera when it's, when it's coming down the pipe. Absolutely. So uh, just, just seriously, let us know, send us an email. We'll, we'll have, to have you on again talk talk to about talk to you about it um that's gonna do it for this week's sound notion um jennifer has so much going on and you can find out about all of the like literally every day for the next month she's got a she's got a performance um you can you and so we'll, we'll link to her site uh on on our on our page along with all the other stories that we talked about so that's soundnotion.tv slash SN. Um, and again, links to all the stuff we've talked about. Uh, you can go there and also comment on the show. Thank you to everyone who is watching live this morning. You can, of course, watch this show live every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time at soundnotion.tv slash live and be a part of the conversation in our chat room. Um, you can also connect with us after the fact on Facebook or Twitter. We're at Sound Notion on Twitter. Uh, this show and all our shows at Sound Notion TV are available for free in the iTunes store, so be sure to go there, subscribe for free, and catch every episode. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you back next week. <laughs>